and welcome to Knock Off Nerd City on your local Midwestern Community College's PBS station, hosted by a guy who, even though he looks nothing like Jonathan Frakes, is somehow still credited as the fella from Beyond Belief. This is not a video about the demonetization situation, that's just a whole different separate crisis that is also happening. So you may or may not have heard of this, but the big wonderful world of science is currently having a bit of a massive problem, and the principle behind what is causing that massive problem could, if YouTube stays their course, also create a problem of similar magnitude here on YouTube. Yes, I am indeed talking about the replication crisis. So Coffee Break did a pretty great video on this, but to explain it to you on the quick, it turns out, essentially, there's just a huge portion of scientific studies that have been published over the decades that you just cannot reproduce their results. Meaning that when we tried to repeat the experiments that led to these specific results in these studies, we didn't get the same results, which is bad because it means that probably those results were not true in the first place. Not all sciences are equally affected by this, of course. It's mostly things like sociology, psychology, medicine, sciences that test elements of extremely vast and complex systems with a lot of variables where you don't even know a lot of the variables and it's almost impossible to control for all of them. Jot that down because it's going to become important later. Most STEM sciences don't really have this problem as much because they're working with less complex systems or with systems where they can more easily get rid of variables when driving any particular experiment. So they get cleaner data with which tells them more about the situation at hand. But how did this happen? Aren't scientists supposed to use the scientific method all the time and test everything a thousand times before they publish it as fact? Well, yes, but actually no. If you're in science, and this is any field of science, you will know the sentence, publish or perish. Scientists need to continually publish new papers, because if they don't, People will stop giving them money, people will stop employing them, and they will lose credibility in their field. And if you want to publish a paper, it better be something that scientific journals are interested in. Because it turns out scientific journals are profit-oriented ventures most of the time that have to operate on razor-thin profit margins because of how expensive the work they do is, and also because of how limited their audience is. So what the editors of scientific papers are after are impressive results. And the most unimpressive kind of results is no results, which is something that can totally happen to you after investing tens of thousands in research grants into some experiment where it, it eventually just turns out that there was nothing there to begin with. I mean, that's why you do experiments. It's to test if there is actually something there and then what that something actually is. So because no journal is going to pick up a paper that doesn't have any results, you better interpret the data in a way that has results. And if you really want to get published and gain notoriety, then it better be an interesting result. Performing due diligence in science takes a lot of time. And if you don't do that, that's time that you can spend on publishing more papers. Who would have ever guessed that setting up a system that benefits sensationalism over using the scientific method would also benefit actors who are prone to doing such things? and basically encourage anyone who wouldn't otherwise be prone to doing such things to do these things, because otherwise they don't have a fucking career. Nobody could have seen that coming! Except the tons and tons of scientists who have been saying this for decades but who have also participated in that system, because what else are they gonna do? Doing good science actively puts you at a disadvantage to your not-so-ethical colleagues. I personally know people who try to get things published that they are ultimately uncertain about, because otherwise they'd have this really expensive education and no job. They will often justify this to themselves by going, oh well, you know, the people will look at the data and then, you know, see that it's actually not quite as groundbreaking as the conclusion of the study will make it look. Because that is absolutely how people get their news about science. Which, you know, let's not even talk about the fact that there's a lot of fields of science where researchers spend most of their time 
asking for money to do research instead of doing research, that is also a completely different crisis. So how does all this relate to YouTube? Well, over the past few months especially, but also over the last couple years, YouTube has been changing the way that it works. They want people to stay on the website for as long as possible to make as much money as possible. And they have one of the most advanced heuristic algorithms in the world working on that problem right now. And one of the things it's found out is that to keep people on the website longer, they have to have high watch time. They also found out that recommending them videos that the algorithm thinks might be interesting to them over videos by channels they are subscribed to makes them stay on the website longer. This is why they've been reducing the prominence of your subscriptions and trying to push you toward recommended. Going so far as to just fucking with a subscription box so they can have recommended in the subscription box. And that makes sense if you think about it. I personally don't watch every single video by every channel that I am subscribed to. And I myself have a bit of a variety channel where people engage to different degrees with different subject matters. So if you're YouTube, you don't want people to come on your website, not see anything that immediately interests them in the subscriptions tab, and then go to Hentai Haven instead. That's YouTube losing a lot of potential viewers right there, so they want to hook you. This is why subscriptions have become more of a suggestion type deal, instead of an, oh, I want to see everything that this person uploads. And the same has been true about the bell recently, apparently. Even though I have belled a lot of channels, I rarely get notifications for them. Which, is that just a thing that we say now? Is bell just a verb? And then you have white bell and black bell, depending on if you are double subscribed or triple subscribed to the channel. And is that racist somehow? Because it probably is. Your subscriptions still do matter to the algorithm, just not as much as they used to. So if you have a channel and you want to farm your audience for views so you can make money off the audience that you have, it's no longer enough to make videos that would interest that audience. You need to make videos that are optimized for the algorithm and that people will click on who are not in your audience because you don't really have as much of a priority state anymore. And that is where the problems begin. In order to be able to survive with your channel, you can no longer just rely on a steady stream of viewership by people you've already convinced. Basically, every single video that you make needs to be kind of a banger. It needs to go at least a little bit viral. And now a couple people, especially big YouTubers for whom this has worked, will tell you what you need to do is optimize. And I'm really sorry to have to break this to you, but that doesn't work. That shit is just objectively not possible. This is the point where what I asked you to jot down earlier becomes relevant. YouTube is a complex system. Not only is it by its very nature comprised of countless variables, YouTube being about as transparent as a concrete block will also try to hide a lot of these variables from you. Ultimately, YouTube is governed by chaos. If by chaos you understand a web of causality so complex, it cannot be gleamed in any useful manner. Whether people see and click on your video depends on a thousand different factors. Your subscriber base, the time of day, what happened in someone's life that day, the colors of the thumbnail, the whims of the YouTube algorithm, a thousand things just inside of YouTube's black box that you couldn't possibly know about. The thing that all of these factors have in common is that they are not consistent. Each of them is ultimately governed by chaos. Now one girl would have shared your video on Twitter and among her 22 followers would be a minor celebrity who would also have shared it because they knew each other from high school, but it turns out she is busy at Walmart because the line is long and she had to buy soda. There's a cold going around in one particular large city where you actually have quite a bit of an audience, but it turns out that this particular video of yours doesn't interest them as much. So they click on it, and then they go away immediately. So the algorithm thinks, oh, this has to be shit. Somewhere around the country where one of your super fans converted just a bunch of his friends, there's a massive power outage right now. The only grandma that watches you? Well, it turns out her dog just died. It's very sad. And because your latest video has a dog in the thumbnail, she's so hurt that she won't watch your videos for months. And the YouTube algorithm, probably the biggest factor in all of this, changes every single day. This is just a small selection of the many variables you have to navigate here. 
And when you upload a video, you have precise data on exactly none of them, making every single video you upload essentially a study of n equals 1. This means it's a study with a sample size of 1, and it doesn't matter how many videos you have uploaded. Every time you upload a new video, you are testing it against a different system with an unknown amount of different variables that have different values. And as you probably know, having a study with a sample size of 1 means that your data is essentially useless. You might as well just exchange your analytics for pictures of dancing horses, because those will only give you marginally less insight than the actual numbers would. A lot of YouTubers will obsess over changing the titles and the thumbnails and all of the side facts around the thing hours or even minutes after the video was uploaded. And I would be straight with you people that I know personally who do this and whom I care about very much and whose content I appreciate greatly because it is very good content, there is no need for you to obsess over it because you have no control over the situation. Whatever metric you are looking at, any change in it that happened because of something you did is essentially just placebo. Maybe the increased views you got was because you changed the thumbnail, but even if you do that 10 minutes after you uploaded the video, the system you are testing against has already changed in ways that you cannot account for. There is absolutely no way of gleaming cause and effect and or estimating an error margin. Just because you have data doesn't mean that that data is useful in any way. Now all this might sound very doom and gloom and like you can never make any sort of estimation as to how a video might do and that's not true. Yes, it is important to have interesting attention-grabbing titles and thumbnails and to cover topics that your audience actually wants to see, and successful YouTubers know how to maximize their odds in this regard. It has a definitive and arguably measurable impact. The problem is, the fuzzier the data that you have is, the less you can actually ascertain which factor and which variable contributed to what in the end results. Think of YouTubers as meteorologists. The weather is a highly complex system defined by chaos. We have a huge amount of very smart scientists working with tons of data and plugging it in very intelligent ways into models that get constantly refined. They can predict the general weather with reasonable accuracy, but the more precise and accurate you want their prediction to be, the less comfortable they will be at making it. It was hurricane season recently in many parts of the world, and hurricanes are at one of those very precision-based fields of meteorology meteorology because you are trying to make accurate predictions about one particular weather event. And even with the brightest minds using the best computers to run the fanciest simulations, they get it wrong all the time. Because it doesn't matter how smart you are, if you are working with a system that is defined by chaos, you cannot make 100% accurate predictions. You can use models to make reasonably accurate predictions about general trends. You cannot predict which beat of which butterfly's wing will eventually generate that hurricane, and neither can you pinpoint the butterfly culprit after the hurricane has happened. Now, I don't want to say whether YouTube or the weather is a more complex system, but I will say that the weather doesn't actively try to hide variables from you. Being able to make broad predictions is fine if you run a channel the way YouTube used to run them. If you know what your subscribers respond well to, you can do that and you will most likely have the results that you were expecting. The problem is, with this slow development toward every single one of the videos that you are upload having to go at least a little bit viral to you even sustain the amount of viewership that you have, you need to be able to optimize that video for an incredibly low probability event based on insanely filthy data. For any given channel, a video exploding way past its usual audience is an outlier event. This means that any data associated with that video is useless. In science, if you run an experiment, you will run that experiment several times to establish a test series. All of the test results will turn out to be within a certain margin, and then you will plug all of them into this gaudy monstrosity of a formula, and you will have your results and your error margin. 
But before you do that, you take all of the outliers in the results from the test series and throw them in the trash, because you know they were caused by some externality that you cannot account for, and you probably don't even know vaguely what that might have been. So all they do is just pollute the data that you have, so you ignore them. So the problem is that YouTubers, instead of being able to optimize for the average, now have to optimize for the outlier event viral video, which is just objectively not possible. It cannot be done with any level of consistency. Maybe it was the cool thumbnail, maybe it was the snappy title, probably both of those were a factor, but you do not have any accurate data to know these things. And you are deluding yourself if you believe that the success of this particular individual video was anything but randomness coming from chaos. I know this is a terrible thing to hear. Nobody wants to hear this because everybody wants to be in charge of their own fate. But it's how science works, unfortunately. You might be very good, you might be very lucky, you are probably a combination of the two, there is no way for you to know. This way of running YouTube actively disincentivizes channels from sticking to a formula. They need to constantly reinvent themselves with every single video that they make so they can chase that viral hit instead of trying to appease primarily their audience. Long-term audience retention just isn't as relevant as it once was. Becoming successful on YouTube and maintaining that success is becoming more and more volatile. And if the site continues on this path, the uncertainty will only increase. If meteorologists had to predict the exact amount of rainfall on one particular square meter of soil in an exact minute, that will happen a week from now. And if they don't get it 100% right, they just don't get paid. Do you think anyone but the pathologically passionate would still go into meteorology? YouTube is creating an uncertain and unstable economy. And the thing about uncertain and unstable economies is that people don't invest in them. Sure, maybe you will hit it big and make a fortune. But the likelihood of that happening is so incredibly low that anyone with a basic understanding of economics just will never do that and instead take their money somewhere else. Or as it is with YouTube, not money, though certainly money to an extent, but mostly time and effort and skills learned in order to run a YouTube channel. This policy is destroying the professional and financial security that a lot of small to medium and even some big YouTubers might possibly ever have had. And the first thing that's going to suffer is the mental health of these creators, because it turns out that when you live in constant anxiety that your livelihood could just disappear from one minute to the next, that drastically sort of increases the likelihood of, I don't know, drug addiction and suicide? Which, you know, if you've watched the channel for a while, you know that suicide to me is a very, very personal subject matter, and it's not because someone I know killed themselves. Being a YouTuber is, at that point, just one step above gambling. And there's a reason why we call pathological gamblers addicts. They are sick and they require treatment. But the biggest long-term victim will be quality content on the platform. Think about this, right? Though the quality of a certain piece of content is certainly a factor in how successful it is, considering the fact that just so many videos that are extremely low quality and actually pretty shit drag in millions upon millions of views, it's actually a smarter idea to, instead of spending a lot of time producing high quality content, you spend a lot of time producing more items that have low quality to them. Basically, you buy more lottery tickets because the lottery ticket that costs you 10 times as much does not have 10 times the chance of winning. It's the equivalent of gambling small sums on a lot of different games, which statistically speaking is more likely to give you positive financial outcomes, as opposed to betting everything on the jackpot because you're not gonna win the jackpot. This is why index funds are good, and day trading is for morons. Which, if at the point at which this whole development is essentially concluded, you are a person who makes, oh, I don't know, well-researched and superbly animated history documentaries, or short films that just burst at the seams with production value, 
a moron is exactly what you would be. The problem is, that's where all the high quality content is, right? YouTube is actively building a system wherein making high quality content and even acquiring the skills to make high quality content in the first place is something that stupid people do. Much like scientific journals built a system that discourages doing good science, YouTube is currently building a system that discourages doing good content. And I don't know if, if they know this even. I mean, probably some people who work at YouTube know this, much like there's a lot of scientists who have seen the fucking replication crisis coming from a hundred kilometers away. But I don't think like the amorphous blob that is YouTube as a company knows about this. I don't know why they don't know this, though I suspect it has at least something to do with the whole oh AI perfect is good will make save us all AI is God craze that's going on in like the California tech scene right now. But you know, I really ultimately hope that they don't know because the alternative is that they do know and they just do not give a shit and are actively looking to literally just kill creators on YouTube by annihilating their livelihood and mental health. Could be a combination of the two. Who knows? The conspiracy theorist in me, of course, sees that if you control the only real powerful tool in such a chaotic system, aka the algorithm, you get to decide who is popular and who isn't instead of the audience. But you know, never attribute to malice what you could also attribute to incompetence. And I, and I do believe that like even, even Susan herself, at least to a degree, actually cares about the creators. I hope. Thank you very much for watching this video. Like, comment, subscribe, do all the things. Share this to your relevant communities, but do not spam them. Consider supporting me on Patreon or on Subscribestar, whichever you prefer. Uh, maybe get some of the cool merchandise that I have. Potentially purchase uh, my book that's been selling a lot better than I ever expected it would. And in that spirit, I'm the guy from Beyond Belief. And see you around, cunts.